Okay, so welcome to everybody. Benvenuti a tutti. This is a very uh, nice moment for me to be able to host all of you here at the International University College for this debate and this discussion with Tony Negri and Gunther Teubner. And the topic is particularly dear to me because it is the topic of the commons, one of the many declinations of this idea of the commons we will discuss today. And this institution has created its own research agenda and its own perspective around the idea of the commons. Actually, there are a few booklets out there that you, you guys should, uh, should, should take and bring home because you can get a sense of what we are doing here, what kind of um, lines of thought we are, we are exploring in this place. And it's for us very nice to be able to do something with Uninomade, um, especially because uh, Uninomade has a, a variety of approaches that we share. And in particular, the idea that research and education should be militant, that there should be both a theoretical and a practical agenda in, 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 in social research and that the law cannot be understood as an autonomous body but must be actually placed in context with a variety of political structures that are around it. Uh, the common have emerged in this very last few years. I think it's one of the most interesting novelty that appeared in the scene. Till five or six years ago it was something for specialists, nobody really discussed it. Today it's uh, a political label, it's a platform, and it's probably also an aspiration for every kind of movement that looks to liberation and to a, the creation of a different, of a different world. Uh, the Commons emerged in a variety of very different contexts without really a unitary masterminding. Um, if we think about it, it emerged out of struggles in Bolivia, First, I would say, it's probably the place in which uh, the experience of the commons and was related to water, and therefore it's particularly important for us in Italy in this moment, starting, starting to make a revolution, starting from, from out there, from the protection of this very important commons. But then also Ecuador. But then, you know, in a completely different context, we get uh, the Nobel Prize granted to Ostrom. And that has created, in a sense, uh, the institutionalization of the idea and also the risk of it becoming mainstream. Whenever something gets the Nobel Prize, it becomes, uh, uh, so to say, accepted as science. And when something gets accepted as science, it becomes very difficult to be used for liberational purposes, I would say. Anyway, this is probably a matter of the discussion. Um, I arrived to the study of the commons from a perspective that is much more technical, which is the perspective of the Italian attempt to reform the civil code. So we started from the legal point of view. And uh, so my own experience has been less from the movements and more from the theoretical side. But it clearly occurred, and occurred in this country also, that uh, the relationship between the, the, the theory and the practice it is what made the commons become part of the Italian political agenda, or at least the political jargon. Uh, right now, not only water is organized around the idea of the commons, and the, the, the movement for water, but also a variety of other movements. The university, the resistance against the privatization of university had the label of university and education as a commons. The quality of work and labor, uh, one of the most important trade unions in Italy has organized its platform around the idea of labor as a commons. Um, and, and so the commons became much more than just a, an ontological category of certain kind of goods, but it became really a, an indication of a line of thought. Now, um, I, don't want to spend, uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but seen from the legal point of view, it seems to me, and particularly having read the papers of both uh, Gunther and Tony, it seems to me that there are two very different ideas and two very different points of view that we have to consider. One is the legal protection of the commons, which is to say there is an, the emergence of the sense that while private property and all the structures that come and develop around private property 
enjoy a very thick protection in the liberal democratic tradition, a protection that is basically the most fundamental guarantee of this, the distributional status quo. The public property, of which perhaps the commons is a category, this is another big question mark, but the, the public property does not enjoy any kind of similar legal protection. The public property is actually in the hands of the government in charge in that moment. There is a sense that the government can just privatize every commons of every public property out of its own plain political discretion. And yet, the transfer of property from the public to the private is, from the point of view of each one of us, from the point of view of citizenship, is as dangerous, if we want to see as dangerous, as dangerous as the transfer of property from the private to the public. So there is a big imbalance from the legal point of view of the protection of public property as opposed to that of private property. And the consequences of that imbalance in terms of globalization, in which the state is becoming weaker and weaker, is actually a very big risk of privatization of more and more public spaces. So this imbalance has to be cured, and the commons can become, or should become, or perhaps might become, a category to protect the public against both the private and the state. So there has a function as a shield, a function as a shield of certain kind of things that have to be protected because the protection they enjoy in the liberal democratic moment, in this moment of globalization, is simply not sufficient. But this is kind of the minimalistic agenda. This is the agenda in a sense that we carried on in the Commission of Time in Italy, when we tried to rediscuss and rethink public property from that point of view. From the point of view of the fact that there are certain kind of things that should be beyond the reach, beyond the reach also of the government. The government should not be able to dispose as a private owner of certain kind of things belonging to the people. So that's the shield, the commons as a category to protect certain kind of utilities and certain kind of utilities that are necessary to carry on certain fundamental rights. But then there is the other part of the agenda. And the other part of the agenda is the one I believe that we're discussing today, which is even much more exciting, I would say, which is the commons as a sword. Not just the idea to try to protect a certain kind of commodities and a certain kind of stuff that do not enjoy sufficient perception in the current legal system, but the commons as the key to transform the legal system, as the key to subvert the current situation based on the dialectic between private property and the state that, protect, uh, that, that present each other as antithetical, but that in fact are conspiring against freedom. Because this is really the question. Private property and the state, which in the liberal democratic discourse are presented as antithetical categories, in fact share the same structure, and that structure is actually fundamentally a structure of oppression and fundamentally a structure of exclusion. And that structure has to be subverted in some sense. And the commons perhaps has another dimension which is not anymore the dimension of the shield, but is the dimension of the sword. The dimension of the tool that can be used to actually subvert a certain order of things based on the dialectic between private property and the state. And this is really, so to say, what we could call the constitutional moment of the commons. Now, is the condition already right for this? Can we really kind of start thinking about how to use the commons to reorganize the furniture of our world, the ontology of the law, in a sense, without having before fully subverted and understood the dynamic of power created by the dialectic between private property and the state? That is a big question mark. It's a matter of timing, perhaps. When is the timing? Is the timing now? Are we kind of be able to determine that agenda? Or as scholars and political activists, are we only, in a way, reflecting certain kind of uh, social forces that do
do claim certain kind of transformation. So in this scenario, uh, in this scenario of uh, a, a fundamental transformative moment that we are living, you know, the crisis is the, the, the label, but you know, it's, it's really a matter of the where we are now in the idea of development, it is particularly important to start thinking not only to the past excellence, not only to destroy, in a sense, a certain kind of ideological structures that limit our possibility to think, but also to start thinking about what's next, about starting to think how could we imagine a legal order understood in a different, in a different way. And this is what makes, I think, this debate today, uh, today especially, especially interesting. Um, so it seems to me that uh, this would be some of the lines that we are gonna we're gonna discuss. And the idea of the seminar that we had with Sandro Mezzano in Bologna a few months ago, uh, while spending a nice evening drinking some wine in an osteria, was exactly to start to get together two different groups of people, two different experiences that are, however, experiences that are connected by a variety of common points. That is the desire of transformation. That is the the fact that we do not settle for the status quo, and we believe that there's, there is still a space for a transformative agenda for scholars and political, and political thinkers. So this seminar is uh, uh, a first step, I hope, of a very deep and intensive collaboration between our efforts here at the, at the International University College, in which we have, a, we have privileged a global dimension in a way, by looking at things from a variety of local perspectives but discussing common principles and the ideas of, of Uninomaly 2.0, which is a movement extremely important, I would think, that connects together people that have been involved for many, many years in, in studying these kind of issues, and I think we can really do something interesting together. Um, I just want to say to our friends and comrades of the of Uninomaly that uh, the International University College has now its uh, applications open. We look forward for having people from all over the world that are interested in spending a couple of years here in Torino discussing in a critical environment things like this. So if you have um, contacts, colleagues, friends that have students that uh, could be a benefit for us, we could benefit from a few years of this approach. We really would like if you kind of encourage them to apply here, and we would certainly consider in the best possible light any kind of suggestion coming from people that are, that are sitting here. So thank you very much. I now give the floor to Sandro to say something more about it in the introductory part, and then we will get to the punchline. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Hugo. Uh, I think uh, you are able uh, uh, to outline uh, the general framework of uh, the discussion uh, uh, we are uh, going to have today. So uh, I will just add a couple of words uh, from uh, the point of view of uh, the uh, Uninomad project which is a project uh, that, uh, in a way, is located uh, within uh, a uh, discontinuous continuity with uh, uh, the tradition of uh, so-called uh, Italian workerism. I guess uh, most of you are uh, familiar with uh, uh, this tradition, at least uh, with uh, some of the basic insights that were uh, developed uh, uh, within this tradition uh, uh, starting in the early 1960s uh, when uh, uh, precisely this city and the working class of this city uh, was uh, uh, playing a very crucial role in uh, the political, in the social, but also in the intellectual history of uh, this country and I would say of this uh, continent. Within the history of uh, workerism, uh, uh, law has uh, always played quite uh, an important role. 
uh, the critical analysis uh, of law has been uh, uh, one uh, of uh, the founding moments in uh, the uh, wide uh, array of uh, theoretical practices that uh, made up uh, uh, the uh, history of uh, uh, workism. And as uh, we were uh, uh, saying uh, in uh, the invitation letter to this uh, seminar, law has uh, always uh, been uh, analyzed within uh, workism uh, uh, from a uh, double uh, point of view, a double uh, perspective. On one hand, uh, there has been uh, an attempt uh, to uh, critically investigate uh, uh, the role played by those in uh, the uh, organization uh, and articulation of uh, domination command. And on the other hand, uh, there has always been uh, an attempt to uh, focus uh, on uh, uh, a kind uh, of different role played uh, by role, by law, meaning, meaning a role uh, uh, that uh, uh, consists in uh, uh, articulating uh, uh, the uh, collective uh, uh, organization uh, uh, underlying uh, uh, the state. Uh, from the point of view, uh, the uh, rereading of uh, uh, a chapter on uh, the working day in uh, the first book uh, of Capital has played uh, uh, an important role in uh, uh, the uh, outlining of uh, this uh, perspective. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, uh, the uh, critical analysis uh, of law uh, undertaken uh, within uh, the workerist uh, tradition has uh, engaged in uh, a very uh, lively discussion with uh, uh, older uh, uh, Marxist uh, theories uh, of laws and uh, uh, particularly uh, with uh, the work uh, of Pashukanish that uh, uh, has been mentioned also uh, by Tony in the paper uh, that he submitted for uh, uh, the seminar uh, uh, today. And from this point of view, uh, the uh, connection between uh, uh, modern law and the private property has been, of course, uh, since the beginning, uh, uh, a very uh, important uh, theoretical and uh, political stake. I think that uh, uh, we could uh, uh, also, uh, in this regard, uh, uh, make uh, a very uh, short uh, uh, reference uh, uh, to Marx uh, and to uh, the uh, kind of very uh, effective, brilliant uh, analysis uh, of uh, uh, the mirror logic uh, uh, that uh, uh, articulates the connection between private uh, and public uh, law uh, that the young Marx uh, was uh, uh, proposing in uh, the Jewish uh, uh, question. But this uh, is something uh, uh, that uh, uh, may explain the way in which uh, uh, workerism has become uh, interested uh, in law in uh, the past uh, decades, uh, I think it is uh, uh, necessary to uh, add uh, uh, something about uh, uh, the situation we are confronted with uh, nowadays, uh, starting uh, from uh, uh, a deep uh, 
a radical transformation in uh, uh, contemporary capitalism that uh, we have been analyzing uh, uh, within uh, Uninomade uh, in the last uh, uh, 10 years. We uh, published uh, two years ago, for instance, uh, a book on uh, uh, the global uh, economic uh, crisis in which uh, uh, we tried uh, to focus on uh, some uh, of uh, uh, the most important new features of uh, contemporary capital. And uh, we try to do so uh, also from the point of view of uh, uh, the transformations uh, of, uh, uh, let's say, the function of uh, uh, private uh, property. Uh, maybe some of you are uh, familiar with uh, the analysis of the financialization of uh, uh, capitalism. Uh, that has been uh, proposed uh, uh, in that book, uh, particularly by our uh, friend and comrade, uh, uh, Christian Marazzi. Uh, in this uh, analysis of uh, financialization of capitalism, uh, we stress the fact uh, that uh, there is uh, no more uh, the possibility of tracing a clear-cut boundary between financial uh, uh, economy and uh, what is uh, very often called uh, in the public discussion uh, real economy. Uh, we rather make the point uh, that there is an intermingling, an intertwining between uh, uh, finance and production, and that uh, finance uh, is, uh, in a way, articulating uh, uh, the uh, capitalist command on uh, the totality of uh, uh, production, which means, nowadays, the totality of life. Uh, from this point of view, it is very important for us uh, uh, to uh, stress the fact uh, that common uh, uh, powers and resources, common resources, common goods, but also common powers, uh, like, uh, for instance, uh, social cooperation, knowledge, uh, life as such in the development of so-called uh, biocapital, for instance, uh, are played uh, uh, an important role, a strategic role in the reorganization of the circuits of capitalist valorization and uh, accumulation. So from this point of view, from the point of view of uh, uh, these new uh, features of uh, global capitalism, uh, we ask the question uh, uh, again, which is the role of the law? And uh, uh, on the one hand, it is uh, quite clear that uh, the role of the law is uh, uh, strategic in uh, making uh, the capitalist uh, appropriation of uh, these uh, common powers uh, and goods possible. From this point of view, the logic of law is uh, uh, kind of shaped more and more by uh, an elective affinity with the logic of plunder that has been uh, so brilliantly investigated by Hugo and uh, Laura Nader in uh, their uh, recent book on uh, rule of law. Plunder is a, a kind of, uh, let's say, function of the law that makes uh, uh, the representation and expropriation of common powers and goods uh, on financial markets, first of all, possible. But uh, against uh, this background, against the background of what uh, Tony defines uh, in uh, his paper the bad common, uh, mm, 
we want to ask uh, uh, the question about uh, what uh, Hugo mm -hmm. was uh, calling before mm -hmm. the past constraints. Mm -hmm. Against uh, this back uh, background, we want, to, we want to ask the question about uh, the possible role of uh, law in uh, uh, articulating and expressing, in a way, a different kind of organization of the common based on uh, uh, the productive power of uh, social cooperation, based on uh, uh, the radically democratic power of uh, uh, social cooperation. We want to ask this question. We have uh, uh, no answers to uh, this question. Maybe uh, somebody uh, will say uh, there is no possible function for law in such a project. Uh, we want to uh, leave uh, this question open because uh, uh, it is uh, precisely this question that uh, uh, determines the uh, space of collective discussion that uh, uh, we uh, want uh, to inhabit, uh, to start inhabiting uh, uh, this uh, 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 day. Uh, I just close uh, by saying that uh, I am uh, really very, very happy to be here at uh, the International University College and I also hope, uh, as uh, uh, Hugo does, uh, that uh, uh, this seminar will be only uh, the beginning of uh, uh, a very productive uh, cooperation uh, in the sign of uh, uh, the common interest uh, uh, in the common. Thank you. In Italian or English? Well, uh, we are uh, uh, now uh, going to listen to uh, the two uh, main papers uh, that uh, will structure a bit uh, the discussion of today. Uh, we will start with uh, uh, the paper uh, uh, of Gunther Teubner and then uh, uh, we will uh, move to uh, Tony Negri. Uh, I guess uh, we'll have uh, a break uh, either after uh, Gunther's paper or after uh, Gunther, uh, Tony's paper, we'll see. Uh, then uh, uh, there are uh, uh, different, uh, several uh, uh, contributions that have been prepared for uh, the discussion and we will uh, uh, go on a uh, kind of very informal uh, uh, way. Uh, and I sincerely hope that uh, uh, we'll have uh, uh, some time in the afternoon for uh, uh, a uh, more informal kind uh, of uh, discussion based uh, on the two papers uh, and uh, all the contributions uh, that uh, uh, will follow uh, the two papers. Uh, as far as languages is uh, concerned, as uh, we wrote uh, in the invitation letter, uh, this is a bilingual uh, seminar, so feel free uh, to speak uh, either Italian or uh, English. Yes. It's okay? It's Italian. Perfect. Yeah. Just, uh, I think maybe we can get uh, after each presentation if there are questions that are yeah. focusing on clarifications of the of the paper would be good to to pose, yeah. and perhaps the after the, the conversation after should be really trying to hit at the point of convergence and diversion of the uh, narrative <coughs> of, of Winter and of Tony to see whether you know how they complement each other and what path they in. <coughs> so, Gunther. Good morning, everybody. It must have been an inspirational moment when Hugo and Sandro were sitting together and drinking wine, and they had this idea about the project. And especially the inspiration was how to structure this complicated discussion between two complex projects. And um, I think they came up with these five questions, which, in my view, really hit the critical points uh, of convergences and divergences 
And I just want to follow those five questions, which I think are very precise, and I will try to be as precise in my answer to these five questions. So question number one. What is the future for the public-private divide? Both approaches insist on a fundamental critique and on the deconstruction of the private-public distinction. The problem is, however, how to displace the distinction and how to replace it. Antonio Negri criticizes private property as well as public property insofar as this is understood as the property of the state and replaces the distinction by one concept, the common. I propose to take the opposite direction of a fusion. The public-private divide should be replaced by what I call polycontextuality. Contemporary social discourses and practice can no longer be analyzed by a single binary distinction. The fragmentation of society into a multitude of social worlds of meaning requires a multitude of perspectives of self-description. Consequently, the simple distinction state society needs to be substituted by a multiplicity of social perspectives. The point is to liberate the law from the simplistic public-private divide in Hugo Matei's words, to liberate it from the unholy alliance between the state and private property on the other. The task at hand is to simultaneously not only to de-economize it, but also to depoliticize it in a certain sense, to distance it not only from the private sector, but also from the public sector. Now, the second step is crucial. After its deconstruction, the private-public divide then reappears within each formerly private social spheres. The public now takes on a different meaning, no longer state policies, in so-called polyfields of regulatory politics, now the public is that sphere's expression of its intrinsic normativity um, in its relation to the whole of society, which law legitimately takes into account. As for the private, there is a potential contrast to Antonio Negri's ideas, which tend to reduce the problem of the private to the concept of private property. In my view, the category of the private should neither be given up nor be dissolved in an overarching concept, whether public or whether the common. Historically, the distinction public-private has undergone so many changes of meaning, oikos, polis, internal morality, external law, state, society, etc., that it would be inadequate to identify it exclusively with individual collective property. Rather, the private would be reinstated and developed further to individual, to, to develop further individual and collective actors' autonomous self-realization. The radical critique of private property in the name of the common has clearly its merits, especially when it comes to private appropriation of knowledge, but should this critique imply the destruction of many other significations of the private, personal privacy against intrusion by others, space for intimacy in personal relations without society's interference, autonomous pursuit of strictly, strictly individual projects against their collectivization in the common, human rights protection for individuals and groups not only against majority politics, but also against capillary power relations in different social dis disciplines, the innerlichkeit interiority of the human mind against communicative intrusion, research in Einsamkeit and Freiheit, sorry for the German, uh, it's lonesomeness and freedom as a viable alternative to the dominant research network ideology. The spirituality of the individual conscience against the domination by public religion and politics. In my view, these are all legitimate expressions of the private, which speak not against, but for, clearly for a reconstruction of the public-private divide, to be sure, not as a division of society into a private and a public sector, but as a variety of distinction within different worlds of meaning. Public, now, in this new sense, would not refer to the one-body politic of collective, common deliberation and decision, but 
to a multiplicity of public spaces which make possible communicative reflection processes within each of the formerly private spheres of society. In each of these public sites, conflicts, struggles, mm -hmm. deliberation and decisions are directed to finding a balance between the site's relation to the whole society and their contribution to individual and collective actors. The result would not be the one great holistic commons, but rather a multiplicity of the commons in different social domains. The public-private divide will reappear in each contexture of public contextuality as a precarious difference between societal responsibility and the pursuit of actors' interest in law needs to be responsive to both sides of this debate. So far for question one. Now comes question two. Where is the potential space for social movements in its relation to global governments? Antonio Negri and I see the ambivalence of the new global governance not only as a target of critique, but as a chance for its transformation. Subversion, not opposition, is Antoine Negri's formula which he directs against private property in global capitalism. My ideas on the constitutional moment use a similar model, but they identify the ambivalence of modernity in a different way. My question is, is there, is there such a thing as collective addiction? Yes, addiction, drugs. No? sex, love, uh, money, collective addiction in the different sectors of late modern societies. Do we recognize this addiction as a genuine social, social phenomenon, not just as an individual problem? Social processes as such exhibit the properties of addictive behavior quite independently of the dependence syndrome of individual human beings. An example from my country, you know, Josef Ackermann, uh, the Swiss boss of the Deutsche Bank. Josef Ackermann is clearly not an addict, uh, the son of Swiss peasants, sober man. And yet, Deutsche Bank is in urgent need of detoxification therapy. Uh, this makes the difference. This would amount to collective addiction in the strict sense, independently of the addiction of individuals, communications would concatenate in such that they become caught up in a compulsive engagement in an activity despite lasting self-destructive consequences. That definition of individual addiction, compulsive engagement in an activity despite lasting ne negative consequences, must be rethought from individuals to social systems in general and for collective actors in particular. Which addiction mechanisms are responsible for the fact that the autopoetic self-reproduction of a social system through the recursivity of system-specific operation reverts into a communicative compulsion to repetition and growth, bringing self-destructive consequences in its way? Such a dynamics raises a fundamental question. How are we to conceive of the relationship between social self-reproduction <coughs> and the compulsion to grow? The disquieting question remains of whether the autopoiesis of highly specialized functional systems is not secretly dependent on this logic of compulsion to grow. And particularly relevant to our discussion, does the recursivity of autopoiesis have inherent tendencies over and above such normal growth toward a socially harmful compulsion to repeat the growth. Now, the crucial point is, this societal addiction is not limited to the capitalist economy in its relentless growth dynamics, as many critics of modernity, among them Antonio Negri, see it. Instead, many, if not all, function systems exhibit similar expansionist tendencies. The famous, infamous tendencies toward a comprehensive politicization, economization, juridification, medialization, religious fundamentalization of the world, which indicate compulsive growth dynamics inherent in each sphere of functional differentiation. This transforms the critique of the capitalist economy into the critique of functional differentiation. 
It is too narrow to criticize profit maximization as prediction of modernity. It is rationality maximization. Rationality maximization that can be diagnosed in many, if not all, function systems. In all function systems, the moment of excessive expectation, a type of high-risk credit in future communication lies hidden in the motivation to accept a communication created not only by the media of money, but also by the media of power, by the media of law, of truth and love. The moment can only be cashed in there with permanently higher payments if we are reaction in turn on increasing credit expectations so that a necessary increased dynamics, a growth spiral develops. In that case, the pathological growth spiral could no longer be regarded as a phenomenon particular to the money medium of the capitalist economy based on private property, but instead as an inherent characteristic of each function system. Such growth acceleration of the function systems burden themselves, society, and the environment with serious consequences of their own differentiation, specialization, and high achievement orientation. Three collision fields can be identified. First, the collision of the growth imperative of one system with the integrity of other social subsystems. Second, com collision with a comprehensive rationality the rationality of the commons, of world society in its ecological context. And third, the collision of growth acceleration of a system with its own self-reproduction. The evolutionary dynamics of these three collisions certainly have the potential to blur into social catastrophes. But there's nothing necessary about the collapse, as Karl Marx postulated, and nothing necessary about Max Weber's Iron Cage of Modernity, Niklas Luhmann, is more plausible. The occurrence of catastrophe is contingent. It depends on whether growth inhibiting countervailing structures emerge to prevent the positive feedback catastrophe <coughs> within the growth dynamic. The experience of near catastrophe, as opposed to the experience of its contingency, as such, may be regarded as the constitutional moment in which countervailing structures potentially emerge. It is the moment when the collapse is directly imminent. The similarity with individual addiction problems is again obvious. Hit the button. It must be one minute before midnight. Only then is there a chance that the understanding will be lucid enough, the will to change strong enough to allow a fundamental change of course. And that applies not only to the economy, where warnings about the next crisis are regularly ignored, but also to politics and science. So here's the message of societal constitutionalism. A global constitutional order faces the task, how can <coughs> external pressures be exerted on the function system in advanced society of such force that self-limitations of their options for action will take effect in their internal processes. This is subversive as it destroys the excesses of the autonomized rationalities, but it exploits at the same time their productive dynamics. A hybrid constitutionalization is required in the sense that external societal forces, which are not only state instruments of power, but also legal rules, and especially civil society, countervailing powers from other contexts, media, public <coughs> discussion, spontaneous protest, intellectuals, social movements, NGOs, or trade unions, apply such massive pressure on the function system that internal self-limitations are configured and become truly effective. To be more concrete, candidates for a capillary constitutionalization are three. They would create different spheres of the commons, understood in a wider sense. First one, politicization of the consumer. Instead of being taken as given, individual and collective preferences are open politicized through consumer activism, boycotts, product criticism, eco-labeling, public interest litigation, and other expressions of ecological sustainability. Such a politicization of economic action represents a transformation of the inner constitution, touching the most sensitive areas of circulation of money, 
namely the willingness of consumers and investors to pay. And this becomes a question of constitutional importance, or more precisely, a question of horizontal effects of constitutional rights in the economy, how to protect the formation of social preference against their restriction through corporate interests. Second, ecologization of corporate governance. What is meant here is not a new managerial ethics, but rather a transformation of the internal company structure compelled by external pressures, a transformation which limits the tendency to speculation and compulsions to grow, necessarily associated with the emergence of the modern corporate structure. The traditional forms of, of worker participation in the firm would have to be reconsidered under conditions of globalization into new forms of social and ecological responsibility of economic production. Third, public control and monetary system would penetrate the arcanum of the global financial constitution as is proposed to combat growth excesses. The addictive drug here is the creation of non-cash money by commercial banks. Today, the relation of paper money created by the central banks and non-cash money created by the commercial banks is 20 for the central banks and 80 for the commercial banks. Commercial banks should be prohibited from creating new money through current account credit and limited instead to offering loans that are based on existing credit reserves. Jefferson demanded as early as 1830, quote, that the right to issue money should be taken from the banks and restored to the people. But who are the people when it comes to money? Or can the creation of money be restored to the people? After all that has been said, the answer can only be that money creation belongs in the public sphere, in the sphere of the commons, though not in the domain of the state. The creation of non-cash money should be given back to the people. It should become the sole prerogative of public institutions, which are not state institutions. Questions number three. Would a new global law be articulated by a different subjectivity? It's the most difficult question in this, in this round. I support Antonio Nagel's critique of private property insofar as private property is the major obstacle for forming a collective subject which could articulate a common politics. The difficult question, however, is how to imagine the new contours of such a collective sub subject. Indeed, the proletariat, the political party as the avant-garde of the working class, not to speak of nation or even race, have turned out to be the grave historical errors in forming the collective subject. But also liberal philosophy and the philosophy of the subject who insist on the human individual as the only legitimate subjectivity in historical processes are unacceptable since both misunderstand fundamentally the transformation of society after the demise of feudalism. Antonio Nagel's multitude in its relation to the common challenges this reduction profoundly and revitalizes the collective subject against the dominant methodological individualism. However, I have two objections against Antonio Nagel's collective subject. Is the multitude in its entirety, as the new collective actor, not still bound to a traditional understanding of the collective as if a number of separated human beings were united in a new community? In my view, the idea of the collective cannot be revitalized as the antonym of, of the individual. Collective actors do not consist of individuals in concert. These are historically discredited formulations. A community is created neither in the corporality of real people nor in their consciousness, but only in their communication. Communi communities are living and pulsating language games. Communities are living and pulsating language games, not mysterious unities of people's consciousness and bodies, which organicist thinkers like Gierke suggested and which return today under the new labels of biopolitics and corporeality. As a consequence, one should strictly follow Antonio Nagel's recourse to Wittgenstein language games and life practice 
but also then draw its inevitable consequences so that collective actors can be identified exclusively as chains of communication once they thematize themselves and gain capacity for action and reflection in their own right, as compared to the action and reflection of individual human beings. Collectives are not groups of people, but social communicative processes. No doubt, the material basis of collectives are human minds and bodies, but this should not lead us to holistic mystifications of the collective subject as a new unity of corporeality, consciousness, and communication. So this is the one objection. The other has to do with the omnipotency fantasies of politics. The collective energies of societies cannot be bundled in the one great political process, in Nagel's words, in the active and autonomous self-regulation of the multitude in its entirety. Here I feel a second holistic mystification in the rhetoric of the common. The collective potential of society's communication does not exist as a unified political entity in its entirety. It develops its specific forces only as a multiplicity of highly specialized social potentials, energy, and forces. And this multiplicity cannot be reduced to the multiplicity of individual human beings involved. One has to add the multiplicity of discourses, language games, social systems. This discursive multiplicity is the historical achievement of the specialization and autonomization of communicative media. Power, knowledge, money, faith, love. And only there is the place of the new collective subjectivity, where diverse collective subjectivity constitutes themselves within the different worlds of meaning and develop the potential to transcend themselves. Self-transcend is the point. Derrida, Jacques Derrida, comes very close to these ideas when he showed in his late work how different fragmented spheres of rationality develop in their self-deconstruction their own modes of self-transcendence. Listen to that. The pure gift as against the profit-led economy. The pure gift. Friendship as against professionalized politics. Forgiveness as against secularized morality and justice as against formalized law. Self-deconstruction, self-transcendence of the discourse. These are the collective subjects which produces excesses, excesses of self-transcendence and reactivate utopian energies in their secularized discourses. The self-identification of such collective subjectivities aims at the reflection of their social identity and their self-transformation. So, it is the duplication, and this is important, huh? it is the duplication of subjectivity. The individual human being and the collective actors understood as communicative chains that will not and cannot be fused into a new entity. This application gets lost too easy in holistic concepts of the common which are based on the critique of the utility maximizing individual. Levinas and Derrida teach us different things about the singularity of the other individual which go well beyond the utility maximizers. So this duplication, individual collective, and you need the two poles, um, creates two different, parallel, autonomous, but interdependent contexts of autonomy, reflection, and responsibility. I would suggest to identify the commonwealth, which Anton Bonelli speaks, the commonwealth, not exclusively in the collective dimension, but in this duality of individual and social reflection, as well as in the multiplicity of communicative centers of reflection. Modern society has no apex and no center, and the common should never attempt to take its place. Such a multiplicity of public spaces would be my counter vision to the holistic commonwealth of the multitude in its entirety. So far for the collective subject, the mysterious unity. Question number four. How could institutional imagination develop? Again, we have a common starting point. The promise of the future lies not in institutionalized politics of the state, 
not or in the institution of global governance, but in a constitutionalization of spontaneous processes in civil society. Here, the concept of empire, multitude, and the common have indeed a liberating effect against the state-centered conception of the tradition. But as I said, the bifurcation begins when I understand Antonio Negri arguing for a comprehensive and unified politicization of society via the concept of the common, while I argue not only for a pluralist, but for a strictly polycontextual constitutionalization, which requires high autonomy of different social rationality spheres. This, however, raises the critical counter question to my own argument, does this not imply, does this fragmentation not imply that society is depoliticized in these partial pluralities? I have a tentative answer. Societal constitutions are paradoxical phenomena. They are not part of the constitution of the political system in society, but at the same time they are highly political concerns. The paradox can be solved with the help of a double conception of the political. This is a widespread idea, and the difference between le politique and la politique is understood in a variety of ways, by Lefort, by you, Agamben. But I would interpret the double meaning of the political as follows. First, the political is meant institutionalized politics, the political system of the world of states. In relation to this world, social sub-constitution would go the distance by the common. They require extensive autonomy against the constitution of international politics. And with regard to the participation of the political system in the process of social sub-constitutions, particular political restraint is required. Second, the concept indicates the political within society, outside institutional politics. It indicates, in other words, the politicization of the economy itself and other social spheres, the politics of reflection on the social identity of the social system involved. In this respect, the particular social constitutions which represent a plurality of the common are highly political, but beyond the state. Why am I skeptical about Negri's idea that a political government even if it's fundamentally democratic and not state-like, come on, pervasively regulate the fundamental structure of social subspheres. If it is ultimately the greatest privilege of the multitude to create a constitution for society, why do I favor auto-constitutionalization of social sectors and not collective decisions by the whole body politic? Again, the answer has to do with the basic social structure of modernity. Modernity society can be constitutionalized only in such a way that every sphere of rationality acts reflexively in developing its own constitutional principles for itself, and the results cannot be prescribed by government hold on you. We must resist the seductive idea that a unified political process, however democratic it is, represents society in all its way. No social subsystem, not even democratized politics, nor the politics of the common can represent the whole society. However, again a question against myself, what is the value of constitutionalization without democratization? And my answer is very little. Constitutionalization of social institutions makes sense only if it's realized by their internal democratization. The democratic legitimation of different social spheres must indeed come up in relation to society as a whole. But it need not proceed through the channels of a totalizing political process, which seems to be Antonio Negri's vision. While societal constitutionalism keeps its relative distance from institutionalized politics and sees no great democratizing potential in a stronger legitimation by a general political process, the politicization and democratization of the economy and other social sectors themselves is high on the agenda. Politicization is realized by collegial institutions. Here I see one. We are a collegial institution. In the general public, citizen groups, NGOs, labor unions, professional associations, universities, and corporations. 
historically collective bargaining, workers' participation, and the right to strike had enabled new forms of societal dissensus, important dissensus. In today's transnational regimes, institutions of social responsibility or formal organization have, will have to be developed that fulfill a similar role. If this makes sense, then the crucial point is, it would be a categorical mistake to transfer democratic institutions and procedures that have been developed in the political system directly to other social sectors. This was one of the main errors of 1968, my generation. Every word of meaning must find its own way of democratization. In the case of law, electoral politics for judges or, or the referee legislative would be the categorical mistake. Instead, radically broadening access to justice and transforming the private litigation process into a site of public common deliberation where not only the parties but concerned third parties and the general interest are heard points to the right direction which respects the inner triadic structure of the judicial process. In the case of the economy, transforming post fordist tendencies of decentralization and functional democratization into genuine processes of participation of the productive coalition which creates the monetary surplus necessary for securing future needs of society. I come to an end with the question number five. Where are now the main differences and convergences? I have three points to make. First point, my counter-category to the excesses of the private is not the common, but the public. To be sure, this is not the public of the state, of public law and institutionalized politics, rather it's the public outside the state, within society, within the many so-called private fields. While the common seeks to overcome the alienation of the private via collective activities and collective modes of attribution, the public tends to strengthen the space of open and democratic deliberation which finds its different forms in each social field. Undoubtedly, common property has a powerful potential which has been suppressed under the domination of neoliberal policies of private property. <coughs> but the choice between different attributions of property rights cannot be decided a priori on theoretical grounds in favor of the commons, but needs to be governed by public reflection processes within each sphere of life. Democratic reflection processes will draw diverse boundaries in each sphere of life of what should be legitimately kept private, part of intimate life, excludes others, and what should become a common enterprise shared by all. Second, what I call polycontextuality has certain similarities to Antonio Levy's fragmentation of empire and multitude. But as a result of long durée historical processes, it's much less fluid and cannot and should not simply be overcome by a political fiat. Rather, any subversive transformation of modernity that wants to overcome it but simultaneously to draw on its productive potentiality will have as one of its priorities to cultivate polycontextuality. If Antonio Mepi wants, as he says, to build not only on natural science and technical knowledge but also on existing sociological knowledge, he would have to take centrally into account what I see as sociology's most important diagnosis of modernity starting from Emil Durkheim's division of labor, Max Weber's new polytheism, talk of Parsons and Niklas Luhmann's functional differentiation, Bourdieu's champs sociaux, ending in its most radical formulation in Gotthard Günther polycontextuality and François Lyotard Lyotard Différent. I should stress that polycontextuality cannot be, cannot be identified exclusively with functional differentiation which dominates today. It is more abstract and opens the space for new social differentiation that we are partially witnessing today, including the multiplicity of discourses which are identified by postmodern thinkers and the variety of hybrid cultural distinctions modes of Antonio Levy's alter modernity as a result of the double fragmentation of world society. We have to take serious 
the radical ambivalence of polycontextuality, unleashing the relentless, reckless, and destructive dynamics of specialized rationality, not only in the capitalist economy, but in every function system. It is responsible for the catastrophes of modernity, for the alienation of individuals, for devastating social conflicts, and for ecological disaster. And at the same time, this very polycontextuality embodies the conditions of possibility to fulfill the promises of siècle des Lumières and modernity, the liberation of reason from religious and political repression, the autonomy of the rule of law against political and economic power, the democratization of the political process and its protection against economic corruption, and last not least, the concentration of the social surplus production in the field of economic action. So far for the differences. Now, point number three. While these two points drive our projects in different directions, there are strong linkages, open connections, and hidden convergences in many other respects, which would be worthwhile to be worked out in detail today. I try to summarize. Both identify the Janus phase of capitalist modernity, its self-destructive as well as its productive potential, and see in this ambivalence the chances for its subversion. Both criticize the sterile alternative of state-centeredness versus private property, of the private-public divide, and change the focus of attention to wider processes in society. They dismiss both the old collective subjectivity, class, avant-garde, nation, race, and formulate ideas of a new subjectivity in the tradition of Wittgenstein language games. In their critique of the excesses of private property and its underlying growth compulsion, both argue for a thoroughgoing politicization of all so-called private sectors of society. Both choose a radically ecological perspective when it comes to define the goals of collective reflection within society, and perhaps most importantly, they judge the democratic character of a society not in terms of formal democratic procedures in institutionalized politics, but in fundamentally democratizing different domains of society. So these were my answers to the five questions. Should we open for a few specific questions first before moving to Antonia? If there is a, any, please. Yes, uh, I have a question. So I, I like your idea of polycontextuality and um, the idea that it's something worth cultivating. But during your talk, you also mentioned the role of contingency. So the constitutional moment arises as a contingency. You cannot really cultivate it. There is a moment when people realize that something has to be done and they do it. So how do you reconcile? Uh, contingency with your, your proposal to cultivate polycontextuality in an active way? Yeah. I think this is a, a very important question and I, I guess the answer would be found in what I would, would call somewhat a magic formula of self-transcendence. So it is the one thing to start, talk about a language game which developed over time, has developed norms, structures, rules, um, and the very moment of its self-transformation, which opens almost at every moment when it comes to decision-making. There's the moment of the great indeterminacy, where you know, all the structures of such a discourse, in a sense, vanish in a big black hole. Now, we find this in law, uh, at the very moment when the judge has to make the decision after you know, long, long uh, deliberation in, in public with the colleagues, in reading everything, but then comes the moment of the decision, and this opens this kind of character garden space of tragic decision making. And here's the point where the cultivation of, where the cultivation of, uh, of, of the discourse and the structure goes together with the space of yeah, openness, darkness, infinity, and where the moment of self-transformation comes in. So I think it's important to, to see these two things where 
uh, a close structure, discourse opens for new possibilities. And this is this is the very moment that I'm concentrating the problem, what I could call the constitutional moment. Sandro? Yes, uh, I leave, of course, uh, comments and uh, more relevant theoretical questions for the afternoon. Uh, I just add now two uh, very specific uh, uh, questions. The first one uh, has to do with uh, what you call in your paper uh, uh, this double conception of the political. My question is, uh, is it a double conception of the political or just a uh, uh, kind of rewriting uh, the distinction between politics and the political? Well, in my, in my view, it is the following. Uh, the, the one concept of the political has to do uh, closely with... Oh, 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 sorry. Um, in, in, in my view, the distinction, the distinction is, is the following. The, the more narrow conception of the political would have, would have to do with the organization of power processes as we know from institutional politics. As the parliamentary procedure, voting, lobbying, and all that. So here we have the classical tradition of, of politics, which means building up consensus, power for making collective decisions. On the other side, we have the phenomenon that fundamental social problems have to be resolved and are resolved in other spheres than just this political institutional space. As we can see this in what judges are doing, we see this in the economy, we see this in the medicine. So everywhere, especially in the highly rationalized spheres, we see that there are immense social problems are decided, resolved by non-political means in the first sense. Huh? And this is what I call the second dimension of the political, which is, I think, uh, blinded and covered up in, in liberal conceptions. They see this as a kind of technocratic or private sphere, while here the political in a different sense comes to the fore and needs to find uh, uh, affinities, select, selected affinities in institutionalized forms of political decision-making within these fields. So I think it would be it would be nonsense to try to to further the, the political sphere of the first time in order to cover the field. Rather, it is a matter of of yeah, furthering the internal politicization and democratization of different social spheres. The second question, excuse me. Uh, microphone, uh, please. Microphone. The second question uh, uh, has to do uh, with uh, uh, your use uh, of uh, uh, the concept uh, uh, society as a whole, the whole society. And uh, it has to do uh, particularly with the relation between uh, uh, the social uh, subsystems that uh, uh, you also uh, emphasize and the whole society. I uh, am perfectly aware that uh, this uh, has to do with uh, your reinterpretation of uh, systemic system uh, theory, but uh, 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 I would like you now uh, to give uh, uh, an answer to uh, quite a uh, uh, simple question. Is the whole society to be understood as the sum of all the subsystems? I'm asking this because sometimes I have the impression it is something else. It is a kind of transcendental structure that, uh, uh, in a way, uh, articulates the movement of uh, societal differentiation. I have the impression that for you it is such a thing. I'm sorry if, if I created this impression, but I'm talking here about strictly about Imminence. Imminence of society understood as not as the sum of the social systems because there is also communication outside our uh, functional system. Right? We talk on the street right? and so on. So a lot of communication takes place out, outside of the system. So, but society is nothing but the sum of all communication that happen in the world. As it is with everything else. So there's nothing. Well, there is not the element of transcendence that we're talking about. Uh, when I talk about transcendence, I mean, 
sorry, you know, how can we uh, present such a complex concept in such a short time? And so what is meant is uh, overcoming the inner boundaries of function systems in the reflection of what the whole society is about. Again, understood as an Indian thing, right? And this would mean self-transcendence of the narrow land, the one of each function system, the lawyer talk about the norms of the economy, they talk about in the, shall we say, in the interest of the whole, of the company, exactly this, exactly this. But the point is the kind of decentered reflection structures. There is no authority, there is no discourse, there is no instance, there is no place where the common as such can be discussed today. Right? The point is, it can only happen via decentralized reflection structure from each perspective. May I take an example from the history of German idealism? Now, the idea of the autonomous subject was not the idea that you would just learn self-realization or self-interest. It was the idea of autonomy plus obligations. Right? Autonomy plus, or even autonomy for the obligations. So, the, the autonomous individual had to create, to, 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 to adapt the whole world into his soul, heart, and mind to represent it there, and then make decisions in responsibility toward now either God or society, the others, and him or herself. Right? And this very structure of internal reflection in the responsibility toward the whole and to the other. This is the model which I repeat and other people speak as well for those social discourses. Now, when I call them collective subjects, this is the very same structure, this reflection structure which you find in the idealistic construction of consciousness and you find in the, in the uh, uh, construction of the collective subject. So in this sense, trans transcendence will not mean an interest from the outside, be it from God or some other authority. Rather, it would be an internal potential within such a collective subject to overcome the own boundaries and act within the same our own perspective in the interest of the common. Well, this is, this, this is how, I mean, how, how I understand what I think. Glad I think. Thank you. I was wondering if you could spend a few words uh, in pointing out the key differences between uh, Negri's idea of commons and uh, your idea of public as uh, reconceptualized in your polycontextual uh, uh, context. And uh, because I think, um, it is a key point of contrast, but it, if it's not explained very clearly, um, no, it could be only a terminological um, matter, so thank you. Well, um, I don't want to just repeat what I, what I said, but perhaps I can form it in this way. I see a romantic desire for unity. I don't know if excuse me, right? Personal now. A romantic desire of for unity in Antonio Leite's writing, in two respects. And what I'm missing is the other pole, in both respects. So the pole of dissensus, plurality, polycontextuality. So what I feel in, in the first dimension, which is the dimension which I call the different social rationalities, that that uh, in the romantic spirit, uh, Antonio Negri is deploring the loss of, of unity, the golden age or the golden future, uh, and strives to want a new unity of the common where the, 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 the multitude in its entirety makes collective decision on the public world. And what gets lost in this, in this uh, uh, dimension is that. Uh, the census, plurality, and, and the point is, of, of course, this is not intentional, but, but the intention is that once this commons is democratically organized, it will take care of plurality, it will take care of minorities, of human rights, and all that. But here's the problem, because it's the logic of the power of the commons, which I think is underestimating in its, in its very dangers. So here I see this 
totalizing tendency in his concept where I have a certain fear. And, and the second romantic desire for unity lies in this other dimension, namely in the dimension of when he brings together um, Foucault and Wittgenstein, if you want, right? So the corporeality, huh? the, the biopolitics, or the insistence of the reality of the body together then with language changing art. And I think what he, although he points very clearly that we have to work with, if we talk about the collective subject of Wittgenstein, he then moves to a kind of unity which I excuse me to say this, which reminds me so much of what Gilgis is writing, you know, of this bodily, spiritual unity of a kind of mystery collective. You know? And here again I have my I have my problems and, and my doubts. And I would stick to a much more, shall I say, sober concept of the collective subject as a chain of ruptures, as you said, of communication, which is Contrasted to con contrasted to the subjectivity of the individual. Adir. Okay. This question is related with your first question mm -hmm. about the public and the private division. Mm -hmm. And you said that the first step to understand this division is first aware to find a solution to this problem is the first liberate the law. I mean, they uh, de-economicize and depoliticize the law by the first steps, by the first uh, step. I understand your point because we should try to find just the law, the pure law, if we want to be coherent to your second step that will be poly contextualize the law in a specific place, structure, etc., society. My question is, how we can liberate the law or the other's elements. I mean, it is possible to identify just the law without the other elements that influence all the law by itself? Again, a, a difficult question, and I, I'm sure I am responsible for, for all the misunderstandings I'm creating with uh, formulations like this, de economize and depoliticize the law, <coughs> which sounds very much as if I were arguing for a, a pure law or for, for an outer key of, of the legal as against uh, the political and economic. And then it must be a contradiction to hear when I say uh, what we need is a politicization of the law, is it not? Um, yeah, I mean, it is this difficult relation of, of autonomy and dependency of the law we are talking about. And what I'm stressing with this de economizing and depoliticizing the law is the following that um, and we were speaking about these different rationalities and that the political rationality and economic rationality are each of them creating a totalizing worldview of their own. Right? Of course, benefit structure that you can identify the whole world in a sense. Or politics, you can see the whole world as a, as a, a, a sum of, of power structures. And the point is that these worldviews are in, imposed, superimposed on the law, or that the law is taking them on board and working with them. So, economic analysis of law is a wonderful example of, of this, how this totally changed the inner uh, worldview of the law into and made it dependent upon economic virtues of the law. And similarly, policy analysis has, has a similar tendency to, once it is incorporated into a law, to see that the law is only a kind of policy making machine. And this is what I'm arguing against. Right? So there is a eigen dynamics, an eigen rationality, an eigen normativity in the legal process as such, which cannot be reduced to either economics or to, 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 to politics. Uh, let's think about the core of it, which is litigation. Uh, and the triadic structure between in, in, when a social conflict is that cannot be resolved is translated into this triadic structure of one person who says, I have been violent, and I said, no, no, not, and then comes the judge as the third person. This has a kind of inner dynamics which creates not only a rationality and the dogmatics and its artificial language of its own, but also a normativity of its own. And when people speak about the loss of normativity of law, I'm not so sure if this is right. Because you know, certain things like alpha pars audiatur, or the neutrality of the judge, 
or that, that certain interests have to come in, or how the whole process should be structured is not just a rationality thing. There is a normativity underlying maybe to find a just solution to a conflict. Right? And this, this is what I'm talking about, to, to, that the law uh, rejects the worldview of either politics or, or economics and develops this worldview of its own, and then of course develops relation to economic and political consideration. And it never loses its dependency on all right? This is what I thought so far. As a first approximation uh, of what we are talking about. Yes. I just have one very, very short uh, and then maybe we I don't know. We can we can uh, we can break for a few minutes and then get to Antonio so that we have our fresh mind. How do you cure addiction? Because because I mean, uh, you, if, if we if we if we follow the metaphor, you know, usually addicted people cannot be cured unless they want to be cured. Yeah. And uh, or can be cured by an imposition of very strong violence on them. Whoops. <laughs> right. So I was wondering, in social processes, how are you going to handle that? <laughs> <laughs> is the second is the second one the revolution? <laughs> the violent one. The, hey, listen, I, I have an answer, sir. Yes. Oh, <laughs> is the second one the imposition of violence, the revolution, and and the first one is the kind of self transformation that I'm talking about. Maybe. Um, so yeah, I mean, you're posing the right question. I mean, is there a cure to addiction? Probably not. Huh? Mm -hmm. But it, but we have this experience of you know individual addiction with hitting the bottom, huh? which I find quite encouraging. Huh? That in the moment, the short moment before the catastrophes, uh, energies are, are 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 unleashed within a person that make the improbable probable or possible. Huh? So I think this kind of, of dramatic moment, uh, uh, Hölderlin has this word, uh, that in the, in the catastrophe that das Rettende auch is, is coming. So I think this is, this is where I put my, how shall I say, my, my hope in, right? If we, if we apply this to the body politic of society, that, that before the moment of the catastrophe, conflictual energies, uh, are, are, are activated that then lead to, to fundamental changes. Huh? So this has to do with this, with this moment of, um, of transcendence. But then, of course, there is a pathological element in my cure, in my darwinism cure, I have to admit, huh? that, you know, can one have a reasonable uh, relation to drugs, alcohol, uh, medicine? So is there a way of you know, uh, dealing with their healing power. Uh, so I'm an old man, so I should have I don't know, one or two glasses of red wine, right? But what about the third and fourth one? Right? So there, there is this, yeah, there is this pathological uh, uh, character in our society, which even will not go away after the constitutional moment. And perhaps there, there's again a difference. Because, but I see, the, the common kind of salvation, moment of salvation, I would rather think we we continue we, we continue the pathological state of our society, but find ways and means to deal with it, with the drugs. Huh? So there is, yeah, is it a, a Sisyphus element in the whole thing, which makes uh, the whole picture perhaps more more barbarian. Saki, there is one last question. actually the uh, required internal process to context polycontextuality. Doesn't it require something like this sort of unity to challenge it? Otherwise it has its own expansionist uh, dangers. Yes, this is an interesting metaphor. And I'm, I'm sure uh, the two poles have to be present, huh? no doubt about this. Uh, the kind of, of, of uh, you know, fragmenting energies uh, driving in different types of direction and then the integrating energies. Uh, 
So my, my point would be that the integrating energies, which I find exaggerated in, in, in Tony's account, uh, have to come from yeah, the, the, the insight of, of each of these rationalities. Because in a sense, they are in the best, in the best position to judge their internal potential with making it compatible with, with the common good, which cannot be done by the outside or by a kind of good willing, good meaning political process. So here I think there has to be this, there has to be this balance between the two, no doubt, uh, but I, I would stress the kind of, of decentered, decentered process as against uh, the, the common reflection about the common good. Very last before curing addiction Oops. of cigarettes, Katja. <laughs> <laughs> Our part of auditory also would like to, uh, to share the discussion and uh, my question uh, is following. Uh, I would like to come uh, back to the very beginning of your speech, um, uh, to, the question of, uh, um, discuss, uh, to the question of discussion uh, private and public law versus uh, your idea of public contextuality. Uh, so as I understood, if I'm wrong, please correct me, you think that it's very, very hard, maybe even impossible, to find um, correct uh, criteria of uh, such division, private and public, and you said that you think that it's necessary to remove this distinction and to go to a new idea of polycontextuality. At the same time, um, division, private and public, it's not very theoretical, but uh, rather very uh, practical question because uh, you know that labeling of such institute like private or public can answer uh, a lot of questions. For example, what kind of principles we can uh, can be applied uh, to solve uh, some problems to regulate relationship or to uh, understand the boundaries of uh, state intervention. So this is my question. I think there are no, no predetermined criteria for distinguishing the, the public and the private now understood within the different spheres of, of rationality. Rather, this is a political question in my second sense, right? So it's a, a political, public, if you want, common process of, of deliberation which includes, of course, theoretical consideration and, 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 and results from, from, from empirical science and experiences with, with given institutional arrangements to make this distinction between what should remain in the, yeah, in the public area, differently understood, or, or in the private. Okay, so let's break for 15 minutes and, uh, and, and get, uh, get back here in 15 minutes sharp, okay? Thank you. Now, Antonio, you have the floor. I recommend that you speak kind of slowly because uh, some people are not familiar with Italian so much. And uh, you have the floor. Okay. Parlerò effettivamente lentamente e spero che Sì, ma è basso, ma funziona. Sì, sì, funziona. Allora, ti ringrazio. Cercherò di parlare lentamente in modo di contrariare, altrimenti non so. Vediamo tutto. Eh, niente, vorrei cominciare eh, semplicemente ponendo eh, delle piccole repliche ai, alla, alle notazioni che ha fatto. Eh, Günther Turner eh, su, sulle mie posizioni che poi come sapete sono, non sono semplicemente mie ma anche di Michael Hart perché lavoriamo molto assieme e devo dire che è stato molto eh, generoso eh, nelle cose che ha detto anche se erano come fanno sempre i tedeschi assai secche eh, e, e, ma a me è, è evidentemente di cui interessano molto le similianze le somiglianze che lui sottolineava 
in particolare due diciamo la prima è il riconoscimento dell'insufficienza delle alternative che è alla crisi attuale del diritto e diciamo così, della vita sociale danno i neoliberali di mercato e le soluzioni socialiste di Stato ehm, keynesiane più o meno e, e soprattutto il fatto che eh, e riconosce che se una terza via non sia ancora data bisogna in qualche modo costruirla il secondo tema sul quale eh, mi sembra che la somiglianza sia da sottolineare è l'apprezzamento della pluralità del campo sociale e l'insistenza sul movimento politico basato sulla molteplicità. La, le critiche invece, mi sembra che ne vadano sottolineate essenzialmente due, a parte il mio romanticismo e, e gli ammenicoli, diciamo così, eh, che ne conseguono, eh, su, ai quali, boh, poi non dico cosa mai chiacchieriamo su questo. Ma la prima critica di Teubner mi sembra importante, quando arriva alla fine del suo discorso, è che io sosterrei una soluzione politica olistica, unificata e totalizzante, che tradisce o tradirebbe il nostro iniziale affidamento alla molteplicità. Eh, su questo non so, che rispo non so rispondere se non appunto con quello che dirò più avanti eh, insistendo sul fatto che io aderisco fino in fondo all'insistenza di Toegner sulla molteplicità sulla, su, que su quella terribile parola della multicontestualità dei livelli e degli incontri e su questo punto io penso che l'unica contestazione che si possa fare è il fatto che all'interno di questa insistenza sulla contestualità non è romanticismo pensare di poter fare società. La contestualità la, le dissolvenze devono le chiamiamo con termini la dissolvenza è un termine dis di rottura rovesciare semplicemente il, il dis il decon, decostruire semplicemente è secondo me è una cosa di un'importanza enorme ma tuttavia questo sì è romanticismo sottende il desiderio di ricostruzione o meglio la necessità logica di ricostruzione lo stesso gioco linguistico si articola sull'unità di visione l'unità prima è la divisione poi ma ripetendosi in molti contesti sono la ripetizione certo è che ci sono dei momenti in cui la differenza vince e la rottura può diventare catastrofica e quindi io credo che su questi termini si tratti di, di andare cauti perché è solo nella pratica che si risolvono. Invece la cosa sulla quale temo che ci sia una differenza, una differenza anche polemica, è la discussione dei concetti di privato e di pubblico. Io sono d'accordo in prima battuta con l'uso che poi viene a fare del termine pubblico quando desidera strapparlo allo Stato usa il concetto per molte determinazioni che noi chiamiamo comune 
noi li chiamo pubblico, benissimo. Molto più complicata invece diventa la questione quando egli vuole recuperare sia pure all'interno di una Facebook di un superamento il privato. Perché di passaggio mi dici che anche se è d'accordo con la mia critica, con la nostra critica, niente, ma ricordate del termine della, della mia critica di proprietà privata, lui pensa che ci siano altri usi che della, di quel del privato che gli desidera mantenere. Ora, io sono molto sensibile a questa obiezione perché penso in effetti che la tematica degli usi, delle consuetudini, delle continuità che finora non abbiamo ancora affrontato sia fondamentale proprio nella costruzione del concetto del comune quindi ovviamente mi tocca il discorso sugli usi e però e noi non abbiamo mai affermato che le garanzie che Toibner esige per il mantenimento del privato devono essere gettate, gettate via devono essere escluse dal contesto della nostra considerazione al contrario noi vorremmo piuttosto caratterizzarle usando la nozione di privatezza questi usi con i concetti di autonomia e di libertà di espressione che sono concetti assai differenti perché si fondano non sulla separazione sulla protezione sulla semplice garanzia ma piuttosto sulla potenza e appunto la capacità di espressione Paolo. e questa è la cosa che ci interessa perché diventa un elemento costitutivo del concetto di comune perché il concetto di comune non può essere né aggregativo né additivo, ma deve invece costruirsi sugli usi e sugli atti come elemento costitutivo. Infine, la cosa più importante che ci sembra è che torni a sottovaluti l'intensità della critica, la alla proprietà privata o piuttosto non sviluppi interamente l'immaginazione come la chiamava lui su quelle che sono le conseguenze dell'abolizione della, della proprietà privata e gli assumi infatti che tutti gli altri significati della privacy fuori dalla proprietà siano neutrali il riferimento al privato della proprietà mentre noi riteniamo che siano strettamente implicati in essa e qui appunto la divisione diventa impossibile la proprietà privata è troppo importante per dividerla dall'amore e di matrimonio per dividerla dall'educazione, vedi la scuola privata, per dividerla da tutta una serie estremamente ampia di determinazioni. Noi pensiamo di essere sempre strettamente implicati nel, nel privato come proprietà, non è neutrale il privato. E quindi ci piacerebbe rovesciare il discorso ed assumere un discorso marxista, correttamente marxista, sviluppato da Pasciucanis, che è molto interessante. Pasciucanis negli anni venti, in Unione Sovietica, diceva ci sono due modi di considerare il pubblico comune o comunque di considerare il diritto proletario il primo modo è di pianificare 
di imporre una razionalità strumentale a tutto quello che è il meccanismo della produzione e della redistribuzione. Tutto questo non può che condurci ad uno statalismo pieno che non ha nulla più a che fare con la vita, perché la vita è costituita piuttosto dal privato, dal singolare, dall'individualità, dalla loro capacità produttiva, che è sempre sociale, multitudinaria, non usava questo termine, cooperativa. Ed è solo se noi riusciamo a sfrondare il diritto privato da quella che è la dimensione pubblica che gli è stata imposta, è solo in questo caso che noi riusciamo a costruire una società priva di diritto. L'utopia è chiara, ma anche funzionante. Cioè nel senso che il comune a questo punto non è inteso né come una sostanza organica, né come un elemento puramente additivo, ma è inteso come quello che vorremmo vivere comunemente. Ok, torno a quella che è una proposta di discorso. Non so quanto tempo ho, una mezz'ora, non sei tranquillo. Credo che il primo punto sul quale volevo insistere, ma torneremo sempre su questi temi, eh? non, non è che adesso lascio questa critica, perché credo che questa critica e questo incontro con Tori Mercia in effetti per me è stato fondamentale, per esempio il precedente incontro che abbiamo fatto all'Istituto filoso... all di Firenze è stato estremamente importante perché in effetti eh, il discorso sulla, sulla crisi ecco, come, come frammentazione come questo cogliere oggi la situazione del diritto nel suo rapporto tra il diritto privato e il pubblico non più semplicemente come una struttura in cui il pubblico sussume il diritto privato no? ecco, e lo sussume imponendogli no? quella che è la dimensione capitalistica e quello, dunque quella che è la necessità della, di una politica eh, capitalistica fondamentale ecco, tutto questo contesto ormai salta e non salta semplicemente e qui non so vorrei anche discutere soprattutto con Sandro perché non abbiamo effettivamente mai discusso non, non, non salta semplicemente perché la dimensione globale cioè e spaziale no? diventa fondamentale diventa senz'altro fondamentale ma deve essere essa stessa percorsa da un discorso sul comune cioè comune e globalità non sono la stessa cosa globalità è un termine spaziale che ci è imposto dalla realtà della globalizzazione Comune ci è imposto, è un termine intensivo, è un termine concettualmente, per così dire, separato, e questo è il termine polemico probabilmente, dalla spazialità. È un termine ontologico, se si vuole usare il termine di ontologia. E l'incontro tra globale e comune è un incontro di qualche, di qualche difficoltà, è comunque un incontro che va costruito. E quindi di per sé il discorso sul globale e sulla frammentazione del globale non ci porta a comune. E si tratterà di capire se ci porta al diritto. Perché io credo che una delle questioni da porre sia sì, effettivamente sì, l'addizione diritto del comune è possibile e se in realtà il diritto non sia condannato alla distinzione tra privato e pubblico quindi 
da questo punto di vista io penso che ci si affida ad un approccio, se non ci si affida ad un approccio ideologico si può forse supporre che il termine comune intervenga nella discussione come uno dei, termini, dei temi centrali quando nella globalizzazione, nelle pratiche giuridiche che ad essa si accompagnano vediamo venir meno come sigla definitoria i trascendentali del, privato, del diritto privato e del diritto pubblico ma soprattutto le conseguenti pratiche giuridiche qui è importantissimo il contributo di Toibner e della sua scuola quando mostrano che in effetti pubblico e privato a questo livello non si danno più e questa è una cosa enorme aver dico così trasato il dibattito filosofico al di fuori di queste categorie fissate che sono fissate non solo badate bene nei tribunali ma nella coscienza delle persone ora è chiaro che quando noi poniamo i problemi in questi termini dovremmo però anche cercare eh, e qui cerco di dire quelle cose che tutti voi sapete un po' come la storia no? del pubblico e del privato si siano consolidate da questo ho imparato moltissimo da, da Ugo e, e dai suoi maestri da Grossi e dagli altri insomma, che credo che in Italia ci abbiano effettivamente dato forse una delle, delle più piene no? tradizioni ecco, in, questo, in questo campo ed è fuori dubbio che eh, il concetto di proprietà privata nasce come elemento totalmente centrale nel diritto privato e che il rapporto a un terzo, a un terzo genere oltre il privato e il pubblico nella tradizione privatistica come nella tradizione pubblicistica è impossibile noi non abbiamo se passiamo attraverso il diritto continentale una possibilità di definire il comune dentro la dogmatica giuridica e neppure dentro quelli che sono i grandi passaggi de della governance ogni volta che noi raggiungiamo il comune ci ritroviamo rigettati sul pubblico le questioni relative al referendum sull'acqua e eh, tutte le altre iniziative che dovremo prendere sono tutte iniziative che continuano a ributtarci sul pubblico noi ci muoviamo all'interno di una gabbia che è una gabbia insuperabile. Il comune è un concetto subordinato al diritto pubblico, cioè alla diretta appropriazione, alla diretta produzione delle sue norme da parte dello Stato. Quindi se questa normatività del comune è nient'altro che una normatività pubblica che può espandersi o estringersi come si vuole ma resta una normatività pubblica questo passaggio non è dato all'interno del diritto continentale lo è, è dato all'interno del diritto anglosassone della, della giurisprudenza anche lì almeno io ho seguito un po' ultimamente con altri amici facciamo un seminario analogo a Parigi al quale tu sei invitato per il 6 di aprile eh, facciamo un seminario analogo a Parigi e ci sono stati compagni che hanno tentato appunto di seguire la figura del diritto del common right nella giurisprudenza anglosassone ma da, da, da Maitland, da Pollock eh, in realtà si tratta, quando si parla di diritto di common right si parla di un diritto al comune di un diritto dunque che si può individualist individualisticamente rivendicare rispetto ai comuni, rispetto ai beni comuni, rispetto ai poteri pubblici. Quindi neppure nel diritto anglosassone, supponendo che si possa parlare di diritto anglosassone, parla evidentemente con l'accetta, no? Ecco così, in questo momento, ma nei modelli eh, così fondamentali si può assumere questo discorso e sempre stando dal punto di vista storico 
credo che sia estremamente interessante eh, questa vicenda sovietica che evidentemente Pasukhani si è morto il capo di concentramento nel 1936 dunque la cosa si è chiusa lì e non ha avuto seguito quindi non si tratta in nessun caso di apologia diciamo così del defunto regime eh, ma eh, si tratta semplicemente di una e, e la cosa mi è stata sollecitata di ritorno a questa cosa soprattutto dalla lettura di quest'ultimo formidabile libro di Arrighi perché quando Arrighi parla del, dell'uso il concetto di uso del comune nelle, nella tradizione comuna, comunitaria contadina cinese e lo pone guardate bene non semplicemente come alternativa a, alla ricapitalizzazione del mondo cinese che sta avvenendo ma come la chiave di quella che è l'originalità del rapporto evolutivo o progressivo se volete così del mondo politico cinese pone un'idea che assomiglia molto a quella di Pajukhanis che non, credo che però dobbiamo sempre fare molta attenzione a non ridurla a un modello antropologico a non ridurla Ecco, dobbiamo assumerla dico, proprio come uso perché questo mi sembra che sia un tema assolutamente centrale torniamo a noi allora e chiediamoci detto che non esiste una correlazione necessaria tra il concetto di globale e il concetto di comune detto che questo concetto di comune è difficile da rintracciare all'interno delle tradizioni eh, giurisprudenziali e in generale del diritto sia continentale che eh, anglosassone, chiediamoci perché poniamo in realtà questo problema del comune, perché il globale, perché il comune li chiama il globale, il globale li chiama il comune e lo richiama perché la globalizzazione ci ha messo di fronte ad un comune per così dire cattivo il comune capitalistico il comune della moneta mondiale il comune della finanza mondiale il comune di un comando che qualsiasi sarà la forma nella quale si corre si, si costruisce comunque si combina lì effettivamente c'è una coesistenza o, o compresenza o contestualità che però che punche che rivelano un'unità una logica comune naturalmente tutto questo dipende da fatti reali che si sono avuti la trasformazione del funzionamento della legge del valore quindi con la regola fondamentale del capitalismo quando la misura temporale del lavoro si sostituisce la potenza della cooperazione i dispositivi della circolazione delle merci dei servizi produttivi della comunicazione <coughs> si pongono come agenti della valorizzazione capitalistica quando il processo della sostituzione reale, ovvero il passaggio dalla produzione industriale delle merci al controllo della vita messa al lavoro, con automazioni, informazioni produttive, eccetera, è bene che quando il capitale perciò si presenta come il potere globale. E quindi lo sfruttamento si instaura, consiste in un passaggio progressivo dal comando capitalistico sulla fabbrica al comando sulla società intera attraverso l'ogemonia del lavoro immateriale, cognitivo e la valorizzazione attraverso il, valore, il lavoro cognitivo, il capitale finanziario, il controllo finanziario. Tutto questo crea una nuova base su cui il capitale opera ed è una base che consiste nello sfruttamento della cooperazione sociale, dei linguaggi, delle relazioni sociali comune e qui vorrei ripetere più o meno riprendere o rilanciare semplicemente l'esempio fatto già da Sandro in apertura del suo discorso quando ha insistito appunto su questa comunanza della finanza 
nella finanza globale nel comando sulla crisi e lo sviluppo sullo sviluppo e sulla crisi venissero da destra o da sinistra le letture della crisi economica che si sono avute erano riportate al distacco tra la finanza cattiva e una produzione reale buona se si assumono invece i presupposti da cui che noi più o meno abbiamo costruito ci sembra che fa riferimento appunto a tutta questa a questo straccio di teoria che tentavo di presentarvi cioè l'egemonia del lavoro del del lavoro cognitivo e quindi del capitale cognitivo, dello sfruttamento sociale e quindi del capitale sociale, eh, qui bisognerà insistere sul fatto che la finanziarizzazione dell'economia globale non è una deviazione improduttiva e parassitaria di quote crescenti di plus valore o di risparmio, bensì una nuova forma di accumulazione del capitale simmetrica ai nuovi processi di produzione sociale e cognitiva del valore. La dimensione finanziaria del capitalismo non è lo sfruttamento dei cattivi padroni sui buoni operai, è anche questo, ma è questo dentro una necessità produttiva che ha reso la finanza la rendita completamente interna al lavoro fino a renderla interna all'anima dell'operaio sovente e quindi è questo il problema col quale dobbiamo confrontarci è questo il comune che si tratta di spaccare di rompere è questo comune che è un comune nel quale appunto il potere finanziario il potere monetario l'ideologia del debito sono entrati dico, a costruire la realtà in questo è il nostro comune d'altra parte è evidente che su questo terreno forse è l'unico nel quale il marxismo ancora può aiutarci il marxismo interpretato però in una maniera assolutamente devi deviazionista <ride> che ha costituito l'opereismo cioè il fatto che si considera il capitale non come, come lo considera la scuola di Francoforte o prima di loro, tutti i catastrofismi, ma come un rapporto, un rapporto di forze. E quindi se il capitalismo domina, scusate il termine, cazzi suoi, perché accanto a questa sua forza di dominio globale c'è una risposta c'è una resistenza c'è un'individualità che è divenuta singolarità cioè connessa alla molteplicità e questa non è una spinta unitaria una, una tentazione metafisica olistica è semplicemente la definizione dell'individualità all'interno della singolarità all'interno della moltitudine non si definisce l'individuo se non con gli altri il concetto di singolarità è questo un concetto costruito nel medioevo se volete un concetto scotista no? ecco così che poi gli va attraversato una lunga eh, trafila per rifarsi vivo in, in episodi filosofici contemporanei che io penso possano essere utilmente riconquistati proprio dentro la critica del privato. Allora, se il diritto tradizionale non riesce a definire il comune ed è sempre costretto nella crisi attuale ad una azione di governance, per così dire ambigua, Come possiamo riproporre sul terreno giuridico un passaggio che ci aiuti a costruire, a costruire un'idea di comune? La governance, senz'altro, è il terreno dentro il quale ci muoviamo. Non possiamo pensare ad altro, non è che 
che, che diciamo c'è una forma di sì, ci sono eh, no, dico, le corti costituzionali, le corti eh, di, cas di cassazione che, giu che giudicano ancora, ma che giudicano ancora secondo criteri molto tradizionali, però se andiamo a vedere in realtà non è più neppure così, eh, neppure in paesi dove la rigidità ecco, così, di quei sistemi di quei forte come in Italia, quando andiamo a leggere c'è una sentenza della Corte Costituzionale della Corte di Cassazione se restiamo sempre abbastanza, io almeno resto sempre abbastanza perplesso come minimo, perché in effetti gli elementi ormai di dissolvenza delle teorie, delle, de, 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 de la, della conseguenzialità giuridica, del deduttivismo del sistema, ecco così, a cui ero stato abituato per esempio nelle mie scuole quando ero piccolo, è veramente impressionante insomma. E, ma comunque, ma non è questo, anche quando si arriva dico, a trascrivere la sovranità in termini negoziali, a digerarchizzare le strutture della decisione, a introdurre un'ottica di relazione frammentata e policentrica, a indebolire la tradizionale separazione fra diritto e privato, niente. C'è un vecchio articolo di Chignola appunto, che mi, mi aveva divertito perché diceva in realtà Fortescue e Cook eh, dicevano la stessa cosa quando parlavano di governance eh, nel, 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 nel rinascimento inglese, nella legge inglese. E qui sembra effettivamente che le luci dell'alba e quelle del tramonto abbiano lo stesso colore Ma, e, e quindi il problema grosso è quello di chiedersi se la governance così come è stata descritta dai veri teorici della governance no? cioè dal, da Toibina e dalla sua scuola possa anch'essa permetterci di avvicinare ai concetti di comune io penso che no e cioè e qui dobbiamo discuterne insomma effettivamente cioè perché il fatto di dissolvere la struttura della, del diritto del comando giuridico non significa permettere l'apertura di nuove forze che abbiano una capacità di espressione giuridica all'interno di questo passaggio. Io stesso personalmente credo di avere sostenuto che bisognava muoversi dentro questa ambiguità e lo credo ancora credo ancora che bisogna fare utilizzando tutti gli strumenti di governance possibili la battaglia per la pubblicizzazione dell'acqua ma resta la pubblicizzazione dell'acqua finché noi non riusciamo a muovere a muoverci sul terreno resta quindi un passaggio tattico per così dire assumendo la vecchia la vecchia distinzione tra tattica e strategia. Una ricostituzionalizzazione, e quando dico ricostituzionalizzazione non vorrei veramente, non vorrei cadere nell'equivoco, perché sono perfettamente d'accordo con lui, ma però bisogna anche che ci mettiamo d'accordo, perché se io parlo di ricostituzionalizzazione dicendo è una ricostituzionalizzazione che non toccherà le forme tradizionali del diritto, ma quando sento dire che ci sarà invece un post socialitarismo eh, costruito eh, molteplice eh, voglio sapere se è la ripetizione della governance pure semplice o no se c'è un passaggio qualitativo al suo interno e questo non ho ancora capito quindi da questo punto di vista il problema grosso è che anche quando si assume che all'interno della governance possano darsi elementi costituenti nuovi, forse soprattutto, e questo è il problema, usi, quando dico usi parlo di usi eh, giuridici, ma parlo di usi anche ontologici, concreti, uomini, persone che si comportano in un certo modo che assumono atteggiamenti, che stabiliscono dei, dei contratti, dei rapporti, 
delle relazioni che esprimono una forza perché qui evidentemente ma non ne discuto assolutamente arriva anche il problema della forza no? che non è possibile distinguere no? soprattutto in un regime di governance si può dire la governance facciamo la governance come la partita a carte mescoliamo le carte no? E no, mescolare le carte più importanti di tutti è almeno dico così i vecchi film western erano così, no? Era dico a mescolare la carta, ma insomma chi, chi sbagliava c'era una pistola sul tavolo. Quindi il problema, il problema, il problema è quello che lì. Ma appunto sempre, dopodiché, il tema del comune resta un grande ignoto in tutta questa vicenda ancora. Che cos'è questo comune? Io non so, dico, per esempio, nel seminario che abbiamo fatto finora sono venuti fuori tre temi più o meno per dire la definizione del comune. Il primo è la formula famosa di Saint-Simon, che è stata poi ripresa da Marx e da Engels, secondo il quale l'amministrazione delle cose prenderà il luogo nel governo degli uomini. La grande definizione del comune che ha dominato secoli di lotta al socialista e qui il comune dunque si rivela come l'amministrazione economica della società da parte di se stessa all'alto equilibrio degli interessi che il mercato liberale propone il socialismo risponde con l'auto-organizzazione economica cosciente degli uomini e questa formula ritorna nel socialismo continuamente almeno fino a Lenin Ah, si tratta evidentemente di una concezione metafisica, di una teleologia del comune rinviata poi, il cui contenuto è semplicemente una razionalità tecnologica industriale che è assunta come un fatto, ridendo sulla definizione di massa del comunismo, che dicevo, in questo caso il comune è il movimento reale che realizza lo stato delle cose presenti. Come voi sapete il comunismo è, la definizione marziana è, il comunismo è il movimento reale che distrugge lo stato delle cose presenti, qui invece lo realizza puramente e semplicemente, assumendo la razionalità tecnologica come fondamento in realtà di questa definizione del comune. Un opposto modello di definizione del comune, sempre tra le, per le cose che abbiamo discusso, ma qui ce ne possono aggiungere altre evidentemente, è quello sociologico istituzionale lo sviluppo dalla società civile alle forme di organizzazione pubblica ad un comune concepito come risultato societario e associazionistico è visto come prodotto di un'attività continua alla necessità economica e alla tecnologia del primo modello si oppone qui un attivismo procedurale e sociale considerato nelle più recenti figure il comune istituzionale si definisce, per esempio in Luc eh, Boltanski, eh, attraverso l'abbandono delle sociologie che mettono l'accento sulle dimensioni verticali e sulla opacità della coscienza alienata degli attori. Quindi ripuliamo la coscienza, da un lato Bourdieu, ripuliamo la coscienza e attiviamo gli, gli attori. E quindi a vantaggio lui pre pre prevede, ma è praticamente lo stesso modello borghiosiano, pure eh, eh, ammodernato, a vantaggio di una sociologia che insista sulle relazioni orizzontali, evidentemente sulle reti, e sull'azione in situazioni di attori guidati da motivazioni strategiche e esigenze morali. E qui ci sono elementi di performatività del sociale che sono messi in primo piano e quando anche il pubblico, cioè lo Stato, venga richiamato ed assunto come elemento equilibratore di questi processi di costruzione appunto, istituzionale, procedurali, eccetera, questo istituzionalismo sociologico, che è fondamentalmente pragmatico, riconosce le contraddizioni dentro le quali il processo si chiude sia la potenza dei suoi dispositivi aperti. Insomma, e qui di nuovo ridendo sulla definizione marziana, un movimento reale che agisce 
lo stato delle cose presenti. Eh, devo dire che in Luca Bolzanski la cosa è estremamente forte, eh? nel senso che non solo si è scritto ultimamente, dico, un partitino dall'estrema sinistra, Luca Bolzanski, l'uomo del, del revisionismo multiosiano, proprio su queste basi, proprio perché ritiene effettivamente che si possa muoversi in questi temi. E poi c'è un terzo modello, così tra quelli che abbiamo sempre discusso, ma sempre dico che ci sono altri, che è quello molto tedesco, insomma, no? Che è quello che è stato, che, che, che insiste sulla comunicazione, che la formalizza fino in fondo come in Avermas, e, e, e che insiste sull'interrelazione, in realtà il primo Avermas, no? Il primo Avermas, l'analista dell'interrelazionismo dell del giovane Hegel è un testo che resta fondamentale da questo punto di vista per capire, per capire la cosa e che oggi è ripreso interamente da Onet per esempio no? ecco finalmente in termini estremamente positivi e che prevedono appunto una offerta in realtà che si dà da qualche parte però non si capisce dove e non si capisce come e devo dire che questo, e questa è una cosa che dico anche in autocritica, insomma, ci sono difficoltà evidenti, per esempio, che, diventano, che sono diventate sempre più chiare nel, nel progetto Foucauldiano, no? Da questo punto di vista, che è la stessa cosa. Sono relazioni, sono singolarità, la regime di compossibilità, il rapporto tra singolarità e totalità si determinano e solo quando non si considera il pensiero Foucauldiano come un dispositivo politico ma se invece si insista come fa l'accademia, come tenta di fare l'accademia fino in fondo oggi a farne un, 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 un metodo una, 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 una trama epistemologica si casca nello stesso problema si casca veramente in questo giro da tutto in questo... ecco e quindi Tutte queste approssimazioni eh, attaccano sì l'idea che il comune possa essere qualcosa che in qualche maniera è presupposto naturalistico organico, eh, ma eh, e affermano dunque che possiamo pensare al comune solo per partire da pratiche sociali di produzione del comune. Eh, ma eh, non, non riescono appunto a risolvere queste tematiche. Per evitare ulteriori ostacoli ci si può qui domandare se la determinazione comune dell'agire in comune debba necessariamente prendere la forma dell'istituzione quando ci si inoltre su questo terreno. Rispondiamo negativamente alla questione dicendo che si potrà piuttosto insistere sul fatto che la produzione di regole che non rilevano dalla legge può prendere la forma di usi negoziati, di pratiche del comune, che non possono darsi che attraverso delle determinazioni concrete e dei rapporti di forza. In questo quadro ci si potrà ulteriormente chiedere come articolare il terreno della proprietà con quello degli usi, quali sono le condizioni di compossibilità degli individui in singolarità, come evitare che la solidità dell'identità chiudo ogni possibilità di compresenza delle singolarità questo per esempio è un problema che io ho dovuto sopportare con molta difficoltà con alcuni compagni eravamo stati chiamati a discutere con i costituzionalisti boliviani no? in Bolivia e lì ci si è trovati di fronte veramente a questi problemi tremendi insomma dove il riconoscimento delle singolarità era diventato una specie di settarismo dell'identità nella molteplicità razziale e così. E quindi questi sono dei problemi che si pongono non semplicemente di costruzione, ma anche come si distruggono queste accumulazioni del privato o del pubblico. Problemi enormi, no? Che si pongono ogni volta che ci si pone un problema del comune, soprattutto in un paese dove la tensione politica alla costruzione del comune è enorme. E quali sono i processi dunque? di soggettivazione che attraversano questi processi costitutivi. La costituzione del comune non additivo, cioè non come somma, e neppure integrativo, no? non con una 
centralità che aggrega il resto, <ride> ma di un, comune, di un comune dunque che non sia né somma né organismo. Può darsi, e qui lo pongo io, il problema è che non è che fuori da una progressione o regressione senza forte o tenue di una dialettica, e quindi di Ophibungen, <coughs> sono domande. diciamo allora così che mi sembra per concludere mi sembra che ci sia per tutti i problemi che abbiamo posto ci siano alcune vie d'uscita la prima che sono, non sono vie d'uscita ma sono in realtà sono delle condizioni sono, si può la riproposizione del tema del comune su un terreno che non è socialmente omogeneo, che non prevede istituzionalità né omologie precostituite, ma è percorso da antagonismi originali. E qui riprendo appunto quello che è il grande esempio della finanziarizzazione, che mi sembra quello fondamentale. C'è da un lato una forza lavoro sempre più precaria, che riconosce la propria autonomia, che può riconoscere la propria autonomia del capitale, questa è l'ipotesi e dall'altra c'è un, un rapporto di comando non finanziario essenzialmente il capitale cerca continuamente di rinnovare la soluzione di questi conflitti non può darsi secondo alcuna determinazione teleologica o dialettica è un contesto machiavellico quello dentro il quale ci si muove ogni determinazione è una potenza che vince o perde rispetto ad altre potenze il senso del processo si identifica e il senso del processo qui è simulato o prodotto dalla potenza della decisione collettiva. Secondo punto, per questo quadro il comune non può essere posto in continuità con la relazione giuridica, non può configurarsi con un terreno dentro il quale si pongono dall'esterno idee di giustizia o formalismi qualsiasi può solo contenere, costruire usi, pratiche e governarli nell'immanenza, nella loro reciprocità e comunanza. Il diritto internazionale, se volete, proprio in quanto non diritto, è da questo punto di vista un modello al quale ci si può riferire, ma però in maniera rovesciata rispetto a come i Smith e gli altri hanno posto il problema. E questo rovesciamento dalla prospettiva di Cimitiana, che non è il recupero dell'eccezione, è un'insistenza sull'eccedenza delle condizioni sociali nelle quali oggi ci troviamo, no? nel lavoro cognitivo, l'assunzione di un contesto più politico adeguato, insomma lo studio delle dottrine delle pratiche dei strutturanti del diritto occidentale e l'esercizio dentro la distruzione del diritto del potere costituente costituiscono solo la via di uscita per pochi rispetto a questi temi ed ecco qui appunto Pasciucani si muove negli anni 20 aveva proposto alcune linee estremamente interessanti dice, vi faccio una citazione breve è del tutto evidente che la logica dei concetti giuridici corrisponde alla logica dei rapporti sociali di una società che produce merci e che proprio in tali rapporti e non nella permissione di un'autorità va ricercata la radice del sistema del diritto cioè nel privato e Kelsen ha fatto uno splendido articolo a suo tempo proprio su Pasciucanis proprio per sottolineare questa importanza del, dell'identificazione del privato come luogo di produzione del diritto di nascita del diritto continua la citazione la logica dei rapporti di dominio e di subordinazione rientra così solo in parte nel sistema di concetti giuridici. Perciò la concezione giuridica dello Stato non può mai diventare teoria e resterà, e resterà sempre un'alterazione ideologica dei fatti. Per immaginare un diritto del comune, ma perché parlare ancora di diritto, bisognerà dunque una volta destrutturata la Costituzione proletaria, risalire dalla pluralità, dalla rete dei rapporti di lavoro a forme di regolazione che comprendano, sviluppino il potenziale dei rapporti produttivi sociali, che costituiscono nell'eguaglianza e nella coproduzione 
norme giuridiche non statali per regolare la vita comune. Bisognerà, ad esempio, seguire i fenomeni della cooperazione della forza lavoro, dell'autovalorizzazione, che introducono un surplus di capacità produttiva nella for della forza lavoro singola o collettiva. E questa è l'eccellenza. Bisognerà percorrere l'insieme dei fenomeni finanziari rivelando dall'interno la potenza delle relazioni simmetriche fra produzione sociale e sistema di bisogni, dei segni, scusatemi, reinventando probabilmente a questo livello una teoria del valore del lavoro. Perché non è quindi della misura? Dobbiamo reinventare, se vogliamo rimettere in piedi questo mondo, dobbiamo reinventare una misura del lavoro, organizzarla. Questo non è un progetto sensimoniano, eh? <ride> dipende essenzialmente da quella che è la forza dei rapporti politici. Grazie. Ok. Um, grazie, the floor is open for questions in any language of course. <laughs>